Who else have you done on? Um, we did Alan Johnson yesterday. Oh yeah, Alan said to me that he that, did, did he? he'd been did done. He? Yeah, that's right. And did he have yeah, horrible things to it say? Was a, it was a very quick conversation because he was going one way, uh, and he made some reference to rock. I don't know where, because I mean he's a no serious musician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who can do bands and stuff? No, we, we said to him we wanted him to play us out Andrew Marr stuff. <laughs> he didn't have a guitar. <laughs> so. No, he's really good, and, and his book is full of. I don't know if you have you read his book. No, not yet. Terrific. I must. Yeah, I thoroughly recommend it. Um, but um, so his book is full of, I mean, how he, he had a really uh, rickety childhood, but how he um, spent much of his teenage years yeah, yeah. Um, uh, playing the guitar. Um, so, I mean, my uh, uh, intimate knowledge of music stopped in about 1970, but I never pretended anything, anything else. So, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Straw, welcome to Chat Politics. Just last Friday, you announced the enormous decision of stepping down from politics at the next general election. You've held two of the great offices of state, served in the cabinet for 13 years and a shadow cabinet 10 years before that. Do you ever ponder the fact that your name will appear in history books for generations to come? I haven't really pondered that, uh, but it's quite a nice thought, really. Um, and I mean, I'll be some references which uh, I'll approve of and others that uh, I won't be so keen on. Um, but I got involved in politics to make a difference and I hope that overall I've made a difference for the good rather than the bad. So yeah, and I'm quite pleased about that idea. Are you going to find a new occupation in 2015 or are you now going to enjoy a, a peaceful retirement? Uh, I don't think that I'm going to settle down in retirement in the sense that I'll get my slippers out. Uh, and uh, the modern equivalent of a pipe uh, yes. and uh, stuff. But there's a different pace to life, and, mm. and, uh, which I've already experienced over the last three years, having um, spent altogether 30 years on the, on the front bench in different capacities. Um, so I've got used to a slightly different pace, but I shall carry on writing, which I thoroughly enjoy. Uh, I've got ideas ill-formed, but yeah. in my brain for uh, further books. Uh, and I'll continue to actively to support the Labour Party. And will that be you know, coming out, doing interviews, doing news reports, or will it be from a more sort of behind the scenes well, perspective? Well, I mean, uh, the, uh, plenty of people who, who do finish in the Commons carry on yeah. in, uh, actively in politics yeah. in one way or another. I'll see what happens, and I may also take on some outside uh, yeah. activities as well. Quite like to chat about the, go back to the start of your career. When did you first meet Tony Blair? What did you think of him? Ah, I first met Tony Blair. I can tell you exactly where I first met Tony Blair. Yes. It was uh, in about 1982. Yeah. And my wife and I were uh, friends uh, with a man called Alan Howarth, who uh, at the time worked for the Parliamentary Labour Party and became the secretary a bit later, uh, and his wife, uh, Maggie. And we went off to their house in Hackney, and there, um, as one of the uh, lunch guests, was Tony Blair, who was at the bar still, uh, and his wife, Cherie. Um, and this was before he'd st stood in Beaconsfield. And he got chatting to Alice, I, I was my wife, and I, I, I was sort of half earwigging this conversation. And I heard Tony say wide-eyed to Alice th that he fancied becoming a Labour MP. And then I heard Alice, my wife, a, a robust um, uh, speech mm. saying, oh, that's a really silly idea. Um, <laughs> because at the time we were going through a terrible period in the Labour Party with very serious divisions. It was pretty vile being a Labour Member of Parliament, you're facing reselection, attacked by the militant and stuff, and the Labour Party itself nationally tearing itself apart. So Alice's advice uh, was perfectly rational and well meant, mm. um, but I'm jolly relieved that uh, Tony decided not yes. to take it. Yes, did you think he was? Um, material of a future leader even then? No, not, not then. Um, I first spotted that uh, this guy had great potential when he stood at Beaconsfield um, sometime later in, uh, mm. in that year. And then when he came into the house in 1983, he was plainly somebody who was going to, to make a mark. It wasn't clear that he'd become a leader um, only uh, 11 years later. 
And that really, that only, that emerged um, towards the end of the 1980s, the beginning of the, of the 1990s. Indeed, he shared a room with Gordon Brown, mm -hmm. um, and he was seen very much as a junior partner of that operation. Early on in your ministerial career, Margaret Thatcher said, I would trust Jack Straw's judgment, and he is a very fair man. So could you pay her the same compliment? To Margaret Thatcher, I thought that was a very generous comment, given the fact that, happily unreported too much, um, yeah, yeah. I'd said some pretty strident things about her early on, um, given the kind of damage that her policies were doing to my constituency. Um, but um, Margaret Thatcher was a, rem a remarkable woman, uh, and she was a political opponent, uh, and she certainly aroused strong enmity obviously in the Labour Party, actually to, to a very significant degree, in the left wing of the Conservative Party. Um, but you can't take away from her uh, the fact that she changed political attitudes in this country, including the Labour Party, and nor can you take away from her a very courageous and very risky decision, for example, that she took over the Falklands. And on that I did support her, as Michael Foote had done. Yes. Was, weren't those pretty damning comments, though, from somebody who clearly opposed the ideologies of, of the Labour Party? Oh, that she's damning me with the... Uh, I don't what, think she meant it. Those comments me. about yourself. What, that she made? Yeah. I don't mind what she... I mean, if people <laughs> want to pass me a compliment, <laughs> I think... <I'm> <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, pr they, they're pretty uh, infrequent in politics, mm. so I think you should enjoy them when you can. Okay. Many, I think, have said Blair adopted a presidential leadership style. Um, and said he didn't really consult or listen to his cabinet on much. I think the Millennium Dome was, could be a, an example of that. Was that your impression in cabinet meetings? Well, I mean, interestingly enough, the Millennium Dome decision, yes. was a, which occurred very early on in the uh, 97 government, was made by the full cabinet. I mean, it just was. Uh, I was present uh, there and, and uh, spoke in favour of it. Reports I mean, of 12 cabinet members rejecting that decision then aren't accurate? Well, I can't remember the exact numbers. I mean, there was a spirited debate, and it's certainly true that Chris Smith, now Lord Smith, um, who was the culture secretary, opposed the building of the dome mm. um, and said that we should have what he, what he described as a sort of virtual um, uh, millennium celebration with you know, local things. Uh, uh, he, he may well have been right, but the truth was there was a majority in cabinet, without right. any question, in an old fashioned yeah. cabinet discussion. On the wider issue of uh, Tony's uh, approach, I mean, what is true is that he used cabinet in a formal sense much more for briefing than okay. for decision making. But what isn't the case is that, certainly in my experience, that he blindsided you as a senior minister. And indeed, in the Home Office, I was basically left to my own devices. I mean, there were, uh, we were broadly on the same track, but uh, you know, it was up to me to take initiatives. He sometimes got frustrated about, say, the slow pace of change in terms of getting crime down. Uh, he had bilaterals, which were very challenging, but interesting. So, mm. for example, I was put on the spot and challenged by him and his officials mm. as to why we couldn't get car crime down by 40% and burglaries down by 30%. And I remember saying to him, well, I'll, you know, I'll, would you like me to work out a way in which you could push water uphill with your hands? But he uh, was right, and I said, when I got back, well, we're just going to have to do this, folks. But on for uh, and, we, and uh, we did it. On foreign policy, mm. some areas he was in the lead, and that's inevitable for any Prime Minister where there's a prospect of military action. But on other things, really, really important ones, and I, I mentioned too, uh, the opening of negotiations with Iran, the yes. so-called E3 formation, yes. and uh, the accession negotiations with Turkey, mm. he left me to it, as he did on plenty of stuff. On that note, on foreign policy, when Blair gave his momentous speech in the Commons about, well, before the Iraq war, you were sitting right next I to him. I was. Mm. Did you know then that some of what Blair was presenting as fact was in reality still uncertain? No, not at all. Um, I mean, everything we said, and bear in mind I was sitting next to him, but that wasn't my main role. My main role in that extraordinary uh, debate was to wind up for the government. Uh, so I had the last half hour of the debate, and it was one of those 
reasonably rare debates where I knew that what I said in that half an hour um, could persuade some colleagues to vote with us because yes. there was a uh, prospect and a reality of a big Labour rebellion. Now, people may disagree with the decision, mm. which I took as much as Tony, but there was no bad faith here. I mean, there's a whole mythology has developed suggesting, quotes, uh, that uh, Blair lied or something. It's totally incorrect. It, uh, absolutely. And there's no way that a British Prime Minister, at least of all somebody uh, of uh, Tony's character, could or would have gone into the House of Commons yes. uh, to be mendacious. Did you not have doubts? Because I think it said the night before you presented him with a completely alternative plan. No, no, well, I mean, that, that's, I mean, that, that people have said that. <laughs> John Campner said that was yes. not correct. Right. Um, and I've given plenty of explanations uh, to the Chilcot inquiry. Yeah. I, what I was saying to him uh, a couple of weeks before, you need to be aware that, in my judgment, Tony, is that I don't think we'll get this through. Um, and, which I didn't think we would. I mean, things then changed uh, in after the 6th and 7th of March, for reasons which I can tell you. But, but my judgment in very early March was that we didn't have a majority. Um, and so I said, you need to think about plan B, whether or, or not we don't put troops on the ground. Mm. We just give active support to the Americans, but in a, uh, a, a more passive way. Um, I mean, that, then what happened was that there was uh, a major bust up at, at the Security Council, uh, in which I spoke, and then uh, President Chirac mm. uh, came out and sabotaged our efforts for a second resolution by saying, whatever the circumstances, vote, uh, France would veto a second resolution. And that actually galvanised support for military action in the British House of Commons. You said in the 2010 Iraq War inquiry that you could perhaps have stopped Tony Blair going to war. Yeah. Do you really feel you had that much influence, perhaps even more than, than the American government? Well, I, no, I, I couldn't have stopped the Americans from taking military action. Yeah. Um, but I said in, in my evidence to Chilcott, and I also said uh, say in the uh, opening, chap opening of the Iraq chapter of my book, uh, that it's just a fact, it's not a piece of conceit, that if I had opposed Tony at that time, mm -hmm. there would not have been a majority and there would have been other consequences. So that was a very heavy mm. burden of responsibility and I was aware of that and so was he. Um, but I came to the conclusion, albeit later than he did, that uh, military action was appropriate against Iraq because of their failure to meet very clear mandatory Security Council resolutions. That's what it was about. Do you think Blair was influenced too much by the Bush administration? No, I mean, he had a very close relationship with George W. Bush, as I did with Colin Powell. Yes. Um, but what is now forgotten, especially in this country, is all of these decisions were taken against the backdrop of 9-11. Uh, and people forget that now. Mm. But that made the American people, as well as the American government, very, very fearful of further terrorist outrages, further uh, terrorist havens developing in failing states uh, like Afghanistan and actually like uh, Iraq as well and therefore much less willing to allow rogue countries like Saddam's Iraq to just kind of slide on through. Mm. Do you think Blair's use of Alistair Campbell to ensure that every word he spoke publicly was carefully, very carefully thought out, do you think that was healthy for politics and democracy. There's a lot of demology about uh, Alistair Campbell, which I'm afraid I never shared. I mean, despite the fact that we have this absolutely fundamental disagreement uh, because he uh, supports Burnley and I support Blackburn, which is <laughs> sort of more than a matter of life and death. I wanted to ask you about that. People in East Lancashire. But he's a decent man, is Alistair Campbell. I mean, he, of you know, his own mission, he was a workaholic um, yes. and could be obsessive. but. I never ever saw Alistair acting inappropriately. I mean, yes, he had strong opinions. I used to have robust arguments with him about some things. But it's not true that he would you know, correct every word that, that uh, Tony was using, that he was some kind of ventriloquist dummy. And I mean, Tony Blair is a, is a master of the English language. But he's just very talented. Uh, and uh, it's, 
it, it's true he had a number of uh, journalists who he favoured, uh, and you could say, well, probably that wasn't wise, he should have dealt with them on a longer spoon. But that needs to be seen against a background in which the Labour Party had been uh, given a very, very hard time over about a 20-year period by the press. So I don't think it was a high crime at all right. for Tony and for his uh, uh, spokesman to seek better relations with the press. I think Tony Blair has described his relationship with Gordon Brown when he was Prime Minister as like being in a coalition. So you obviously know that experience various disputes between them yourself, but do you remember when that tension really began to become an issue? And did anything specific trigger it, do you think? Well, the I mean the tension was there from the middle of May nineteen ninety four when John mm. Smith died, uh, and Gordon Brown thought that he should have been the, as it were, the anointed one rather than Tony. Now I was very clear at the time that uh, Tony was the man. It might have been a different time when Gordon was the man, but Tony was the man who uh, was uh, most well placed yeah. to lead us uh, to victory. So uh, it made it, I think it probably would have been better, frankly, if Gordon had stood in that election, because it would have kind of cleared the air, but he didn't. Uh, and there was some conversation that took place in some restaurant in Islington, and I wasn't present, I don't know who else was, I don't think anybody else was there, so diff opinions yeah. different. But Gordon became preoccupied with this idea he really ought to be Prime Minister, and relations became most difficult after 2004, where, and you know that Tony is quite open about this in his uh, memoirs, where he seemed to give by his own admission, some kind of undertaking to Gordon that he would stand down, and then he thought, well, actually, I don't think I'm going to. Um, I mean, the tragedy of Gordon Brown is that um, we all thought he could do the job of Prime Minister when the time came, but when the time came, it actually turned out that he wasn't suited in terms of his character and constitution for the job, and he found being a leader and making that plethora of decisions which just pile in on you very difficult. Do you think he knows that? I have no idea, um, but I, it, it's 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 not nice to see someone who desperately no, desperately no. wants something, and then finds finds in a very public way uh, that they might have been better doing something else. Would you say Tony Blair was pushed out unfairly? Well, the, 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 listen, I mean, the, 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 what happened was yes. it, that. The, the, Tony lost the support of the Parliamentary Labour Party, not to do with Gordon Brown, let me say, but to do with his um, rather unqualified support for the Israelis in respect to what was going on in uh, South Lebanon. I mean, that was, that was the mm. problem. Uh, and I find my, find myself, as a member of Tony's cabinet, uh, on opposite sides on this. So did most of us, uh, and because what the Israelis were doing was wholly disproportionate. It, they are, had a right to take some action, but not that. Um, and, I mean, one of my frustrations was that if, I'd, if Tony had kept me uh, as Foreign Secretary, I think I might have been able to save him from himself. And that right. also may sound like a conceit. I don't think it is. Um, but anyway, there we mm. are. So that just led to a situation where he already sort of half indicated he was going to go. Um, Alan Johnson yesterday told us that Blair was disgracefully pushed out. Well, he wasn't, I mean, that's, uh, I, uh, it's not language that uh, I would use. It, I mean, then he was subject to something I had nothing to do mm. with, which was this uh, attempt, this, this push. Um, but the, the, the problem was that Tony allowed circumstances to develop in, in which his own support in the Parliamentary Party was eroding. And if he'd been less unqualified in support mm. for uh, the Israelis, and they were in a pretty unjustifiable position, then I don't think that those who wanted to exercise uh, this putsch would have been able to do so. And you were then still prepared to serve under Gordon Brown? Yeah, so was Alan. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, do you disagree with any of these descriptions of what it's like to have a top post in the cabinet? I've okay. got written down here stressful, unpopular, enormous responsibility, invasive of privacy, physically and emotionally draining, not especially well paid. Why on earth did you decide that this is well, what you I wanted to do? Say, actually, stressful. It wasn't stressful. Well, there is stress in these jobs, okay. Yes. But um, you then got to know how to deal with this. But interestingly enough, all, all the epidemiological evidence shows that people 
who suffer most from stress are people at the bottom or in the middle of organisations, not at the top. There's indeed been, a, yeah. since you ask, a longitudinal study of uh, civil servants like that. So, if, okay, so you've got loads of work as a minister. Um, one of the things you find out pretty quickly is whether or not you've got the capacity and the character to make decisions which are going to be imperfect, and some of them will turn out to be wrong, but, but move on to the mm. next thing. And if it, they are wrong, and the public notice, and you've got the media outside your house, well, you just have to deal with it. Um, so there's pressure. I didn't ever feel overwhelmed by stress. I've ordered, had it done. I thought it was a fantastic privilege to be a minister uh, and to do stuff. I mean, you know, make a difference. Yeah. Um, so why do people do it? Because they, you can make a difference, uh, and it's a fantastic privilege to do these jobs. You've got huge discretion, fantastic discretion. I mean, I have plenty, all sorts of things, um, which I was able to do, say, as Home Secretary or Justice Secretary, which uh, others would not have done, yes. but I wanted to do. So, And moving on to more modern day politics, do you think Ed Miliband is right for the job? He is, and I think it's actually, I didn't vote for Ed, I voted for his brother. Mm. Um, and I was, the jury was out with me for a bit, but I think he's shown over the last uh, particularly three months he's absolutely right for the job and he's got real steel as well. And for 2015, does he stand a chance? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, you, you wait and see. Yes. He could easily be in uh, Downing Street. <laughs> and finally, any favourite memory from your time in Parliament? Favourite memories? Ha! <laughs> uh, loads. Um, <laughs> but. Um, Oh, my. I mean, there, there have been some, I mean, it's been, it's, it's been great to be there at mm. historic moments. And one of the, the most interesting ones where I think people saw that our democracy is alive and well uh, was on August the 29th of this year on the vote on Syria. Because mm. we all surprised ourselves by that vote. Yes. And it's, it had repercussions across the world. And far from being America's poodle, it, the, the effect of that vote in mm. the Palace of Westminster influenced dramatically uh, what then happened in the United States. Jack Straw, thank you very much thank for you. joining us. Really appreciate so, it. Very nice to see you. Cheers. Thank, thank you. you.